the clock. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, um, I'm delighted to be here. I, um, uh, I accept, you know, I guess one of the tricks of getting me to the regional conferences is inviting me six months or five months ahead of time, so I can't say no. <laughs> <laughs> And it's been, a, it's been a whirlwind week. I was out at uh, Curacao, um, the hurricane meeting down there, WMO sponsored a meeting. And uh, beginning of the week, yes, I wound up at the old executive building in the White House on Wednesday. By the time I got down here, I didn't even know what day it was. <laughs> but I've had a great visit. So I was down at Jackson yesterday, uh, the forecast office in the Jackson State University. And then here um, at Mississippi State, and I, I keep on, I've been in Mississippi a number of times. I have relatives that lived in Jackson when I was growing up. So I know, don't make the mistake of Mississippi State versus University. I've been practicing. <laughs> <laughs> so, University of Mississippi, or Southern Mississippi, you know, so. so anyway, um, and what I've seen here uh, at, the, at the schools, at the forecast office of Jackson, I'm going to Birmingham this afternoon. Um, you know, going to the schools, going to the universities, I try to get to about five a year. And um, yesterday and today is no exception. The level of uh, the, 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 the school uh, spirit, the level of uh, enthusiasm and love for what the students are doing uh, in this field uh, continues to amaze me. And it reminds, it reminds me of me, okay, when I went through school at the University of Wisconsin. But even before that, before you got to the uh, university level. Uh, what we've been able to do in getting our data, getting our information out um, uh, to people in the K-12 arena uh, has been nothing short of uh, phenomenal and raising the interest in what we do. So uh, seeing, seeing this today on, and what I saw yesterday, just keep it up, take it with you. Um, it really is a great field to be in. Um, what, and, and of course, <clears throat> what we're doing today and the recognition of what we're doing today is so much greater in terms of societal uh, benefits um, than when I was going through school, going to the university. It was a, literally an academic personal interest uh, that kept me going. Uh, but the, the changes over the last 10, 15, 20 years, uh, we have really become critically important. Uh, to society. And that's what I'm going to speak to today in this building of Weather Any Nation. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, now, there, there we go. So, what I'll do is provide a background on the National Weather Service um, and why this urgency for change. And the change, you know, the bottom line here is. Uh, when I was going through school, um, entering um, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, um, going over the Weather Service, uh, because I was interested in R2O, research operations, and people told me that I was really interested in that, I should know something about operations. That's a good point, folks. Um, and I haven't left. I haven't looked back. Okay. Um, but forecasters, up until about 10 years ago, I would say, for the most part, we have exceptions, but for the most part, firmly believe their job was over with the forecast in the morning. And the idea of taking that extra step to connecting with decision makers was not in their job description. Well, it is today. And what, we're, uh, what we'll show is why is that urgent? What do we mean by building a weather-ready nation? How are we doing? What does it mean for the students as they go through uh, their undergraduate and graduate levels, um, and, um, and then an international update. So, background on the National Weather Service. So, the students in there, uh, if you're applying for a job somewhere, know the mission statement, right? So, when I was at Goddard Space Flight Center, we were getting asked all the time, why are we doing meteorological research at NASA? And I know for those folks uh, in uh, Huntsville, you know, with Marshall Space Flight Center, they were getting the same questions back then, okay. So here's our mission statement, provide weather, water, and seasonal data, uh, forecasts and warnings for the protection of life and property. 
and the enhancement of the national economy. And I want to come back to this. First of all, um, it's an action verb. If you see mission statements with passive verbs, you, know, you might want to look someplace else. <laughs> um, okay. Now, the vision uh, is a weather-ready nation where society is prepared for and responds to okay, weather and water events where communities are ready, responsive, and if they are ready and responsive, they'll be more resilient. That's an incredible vision statement, and it's not easy, as we're finding out, to try to get to that. Now, I contend that within the Weather Service, and, and we have heard two talks today as an illustration of this, we have, I, I believe, the, a, a workforce that is as dedicated to this mission and to public service as you'll ever find in any federal or any government agency and probably any private sector firm that's been reviewed by McKinsey, okay? Because when they reviewed us, and they, show, and they actually have a measure of that dedication of a workforce mission, they literally came back to us and said it was off the charts. So they got the normal distribution curve for all the government agencies and all the private sector firms, and we were way off to the right. You want to see a, a distribution chart with a tail? Go to McKinsey's uh, analysis of us. All right, so it's really great. And, um, and yet, to get to this, which is what drives many of our people, right, we got to do this. That's one of the things that I will want to show uh, today. So the uh, operations, I'm not sure everybody's aware of this, but we have a pretty big domain, you know, from Guam and Alaska through the continental U.S. all the way to Puerto Rico. We have 122 forecast offices. We have seven weather service units, 21 of those. We have 13 river forecast centers. We have nine centers um, under the uh, umbrella of NSEC. I was the director of for 14 years. And the new center here is the National Water Center uh, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Now, if you look at this whole domain space, and then you consider the fact that one of these centers is the Space Weather Prediction Center, and another center over here uh, in Maryland is the Ocean Prediction Center. We cover about a third of the globe from the sun to the sea. So if you're not interested in that domain space, you're in the wrong conference. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're interested in service, okay, we're now doing service in that whole domain space, predictive service. And we're the only agency in the whole federal government that has the word prediction or forecast in the mission statement. So um, just keep that in mind. There's never a dull moment. All right? uh, I can tell you there's never a dull moment when you're the director of the National Weather Service. <laughs> um, but within this, uh, uh, within this domain space and what we do every day, every minute of the day, um, you know, affects this area. So why the urgency for change? A couple of things. Um, everybody has their favorite uh, war story here. But this is, the, uh, this is a chart that's now been produced uh, by the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. These are the top economic folks in the world getting together. Um, and for the last three years now, 17, 18, and now 19, uh, they, they've shown this chart with the impacts going up and the likelihood of what is considered a risk to the world economy. Okay, and up at the top right of the most likelihood to occur and the greatest impact are extreme weather events. And this just started about, uh, I think 2017 was the first year that it popped to the right. Uh, and then natural head disasters and then the water crisis, which involves more than floods and droughts, but actually, you know, whether there's enough water for societies to survive is part of that, that dot as well. But there we are on the top right. We, you know, if you just look at this chart, you know, it pays to be a meteorologist right now, right? Because it's not just from a societal uh, benefit perspective. It's if you're running a business, I talked to the vice president of IBM that's uh, 
you know, uh, now applying Watson to meteorological. And I asked them why they picked meteorology after they, you know, still cancer was their first area that they focused on with Watson. So they want to capture the B2B market. They're basically saying that every business needs weather information, and if they don't know that, they'll go out of business. All right? And we're seeing that across the whole spectrum. So there, there we are, okay, right in the top right-hand corner. And then, uh, just not to put too far a point on it, NCEI uh, puts out these billion-dollar events every year, and they're growing. Uh, one of the reasons I was uh, dealing at the White House and National Security Group is that you know, it's about um, every year we're getting 120, 140 billion average now directed towards natural disasters. And they're basically saying, well, how, you know, if we're going to increase our resiliency, what can we do? And then they were telling us, they think the Weather Service is doing this right. I keep on telling them, we've got a long way to go, all right? But the idea is, is that we're addressing this at the local level and then building up rather than you know, look at a national problem and try to come down. Because a lot of these things uh, are, I mean, they, you know, we, we look at synoptic meteorology, but the impacts are local. And if you're going to address people's response to these uh, types of events, that's local. But here we go again. You know, we had um, uh, 18, um, uh, this should have been, I think, yeah, 2018, um, 2017, we had the um, we had a number of hur the hurricanes that um, alone uh, had impacts up to about uh, I think the total was in the 200 to 300 billion dollar range. So absolutely incredible. And you know now we're seeing destruction in this part of the country, which I think we're going to reach historic levels with that when we put the rest of the snow melt on top of what's already happened um, in Nebraska, Iowa, in the southern part of South Dakota. I mean, it's, a, it's just tremendous uh, potential uh, for a, a major water disaster up there. So we have that. Now, in terms of urgency for change, and this is something that the Weather Service discovered the hard way. Uh, we had um, a strategic, I've been involved in strategic planning for a long time. Uh, even before I got my PhD, I was involved with uh, agencies um, in designing uh, field programs like uh, Sesame and uh, Storm, which is a predecessor to the U.S. Weather Research Program. And it's really hard to get people to um, organize themselves around a strategic plan and a vision. So the Weather Service, uh, we tried something in the late uh, 1990s, early 2000s. I don't know how many Weather Service employees remember the No Surprise Weather Service. Okay. I, the joke is, is it lasted one midnight shift. <laughs> and then it was done. So the employees did not embrace it. And part of the issue is now there have been books written on motivating workforce for, you know, uh, vision saving. People personalize an urgency to change. And if the people don't personalize it, it doesn't tend to stick. Right? So this is my this is my story. So I think uh, was mentioned in 1974 outbreak, the uh, the talk, the first talk here, uh, Dixie Alley. Um, Jason, you mentioned the uh, you mentioned the 1974 so. Okay. So I was a student at the University of Wisconsin, and I know I'm dating myself here, but <laughs> the fact is, in this time period. Right? Uh, and you look at the summary of the storms between this time period and this time period here uh, for the April 27, 28, 2011, you'll see similarities here. The number of tornadoes, uh, the strength, um, the tornado track lengths that were ended up are almost identical in these two cases. Um, the tornado time is almost identical. We rounded some numbers here. Now, if you look at the process, the forecast process that happened, in, the night before the outbreak, the uh, National Severe Storm Forecast Center in Kansas City put out indications. It was, there were enough indications there that they were ready to say something like, you know, tomorrow's going to be an interesting day. That was it. <laughs> um, <laughs> watches were put out on the 12Z soundings. Now, it's really interesting. 
you know, back in the back in the sixties and seventies, one of the things you know I was going to note um, about some of these talks that we heard this morning. Back in the sixties and seventies, the preconditioning of a, a convective environment was thought to be synoptic scale in nature. So all you needed was twelve Z sounding, right? So wasn't there twelve Z? Wasn't you know what's there to worry about, right? Um, the release of the instability was mesoscale. So there's a real focus on surface features initiating the convective instability, but the development. But what we saw today is that these changes could happen. When you talk mesoscale, it's not just spatial. It's time changes. These things can really cook in about two, three hours. Right? So you got watches before noon. Okay? The warnings were not put out until a tornado was sighted on the ground. Okay? That was your warning criteria. Now, we go to the modern part of this. This case actually started the whole planning process. Got people thinking, we got to change this. Right? So you get to here now. Um, we had uh, SPC products four to six days in advance. Really nice TikTok right now. People were, you know, as meteorologists, we knew this was coming, right? Uh, watches had, I think the uh, probability detection with watches were up in the 95 to 97 percent level. 24 minute average lead time for warnings. 24 minutes! Well, everybody's going to give a round of applause for the success of the modernization. Then the fatalities. <laughs> Almost identical. So I can tell you that inside the Weather Service, the, uh, the celebrations lasted for about maybe a half a day, and then the, the fatality numbers really started piling up. And it was a sobering experience. What are we doing here? So I got called by Catherine Sullivan. Um, she wasn't the head of NOAA at the time, but as the head, she called me as the head of NSEP, um, wanted to talk to me about setting up a national conversation about this. Um, Joplin was also happened this year, um, and then there was one in southwest Michigan. Just tremendous fatality rates that are obviously unacceptable. So set up this vital conversation down in Norman, Oklahoma. We had a number of researchers there. We had physical scientists there, and we had a number of social scientists there. And Laura, you were, you were at that meeting. I know there was one social scientist that got up and she said, well, it was about, and then I'll put a, a blank, <laughs> time. Okay, this, better, this better not be just a one-night stand kind of thing, okay? I mean, she, she really just sliced this right down the middle, right? All right uh, from a social science point of view, because the bottom line here, it's going to come down to social science if we're going to connect to decision makers, right? So what came out of that, focus on the last mile, delivery of warnings, assess and update warning dissemination strategy. Right? I mean, I'm thinking 40 minute lead time on tornadoes. People are going to shelter in place. I, they're not going to sh necessarily shelter in place. They might get their car and go where their kids are, in school on the other side of town, or whatever, or try to outrun it. Um, you know, I, th I went into this meeting thinking, well, we got a problem with the watch program, but the warnings, you know, that'll turn out all right. Man, everything got blown up at this meeting. Okay. So it's the message delivered equal to the message received. Impact based forecasts and warnings. This, this really came out of this last mile thing that it really crystallized. We were already, you know, I, I led the strategic group that came out with Weather Radio Nation. I did not come out with the term Weather Radio Nation. That was the non-meteorologist on our group that came up with that term. Okay. Um, but this was a real um, conclusion that came out of that focus on public safety. And it would involve not only improve, I should have put improved and continuous outreach and education. Right. So, if that isn't enough for you to start thinking beyond the forecast and warning, here's a quote from 1993. I was actually an editor on this paper. It was a controversial paper at the time. It was Alan Murphy. It was one of his last papers before he passed away. Um, <coughs> really a tremendous statistician type, you know, post-processing, but also got started getting into this notional aspect is making a forecast good enough. 
So it should be understood that forecasts possess no intrinsic value. We invest hundreds of millions of dollars in developing our modeling, our getting our observations there in real time, get it, everything out in real time. So we, when a meteorologist reads this, you think no intrinsic value. Okay. Where, does it re, where does it realize its value? They acquire in their ability to influence decisions made by users of the forecast. He wrote this in 1993. So, and if you re, if you see what's going on now in on the Hill, for example, uh, uh, discussions about funding research, you you better be up there showing societal value these days to get and then track it back to research needs or operational needs or whatever. Okay. So those two things were my personal story in terms of trying to understand what we needed to do um, to address this ready, responsive resilience. So becoming a weather-ready nation is about building community, community resiliency in the face of increasing vulnerability to extreme weather, water, and climate events. Whether it's short-term climate events, droughts being the principal one, well, longer term uh, climate events, like global warming, sea levels are rising. Sea levels don't rise because it's getting colder or the temperature is staying the same. Okay? Volume increases, more water is running into it, it's rising. So you get, you get any kind of northeastern now along the northeast coast, and you've got sea walls being topped. You've got communities being flooded that hadn't been flooded in decades before they built the sea wall. <coughs> Things are happening. All right? um, we're seeing more extreme rainfall events, which have statistical significance and actually mapped into Tom Call's hypothesis for seeing more extreme rainfall events due to global warming that he published in the early 90s. We're seeing this, folks. All right, so we have to address this. We touch every county every day. We're one of the few agencies that can actually say that, if not the only one. Um, and we're supporting national security and public safety. So. This weather ready nation to be ready, responsive, and resilient. What do we need to do? Better forecasts and warnings. Yes. Right now, and probably forever, we'll never be able to give an emergency manager a perfect forecast. Okay? I, anybody make perfect forecasts? I don't. I like to tell my family I'm perfect, but that doesn't work. <laughs> anymore. All I need is one snowstorm uh, that doesn't happen, and I get reminded of that, okay? Um, consistent products and services. Not only more accurate, but consistency. If we've got a whole range of information going out there from different weather service offices, from a, a weather service, um, um, uh, a private sector firm, uh, three different uh, media outlets, if they're all different, I can guarantee you that people in that community are not going to know what the heck to do. And I'm not saying that I'm better than you know, the, the outlets, we've got to work with the outlets. We depend on them to get the message out. But if everybody is doing, I'm better than that other person, and they've been wrong 50 times, so why would you, put, you know, this is what was going on at the turn of the century, folks. This is what was going on, and people trying to, you know, it just in, in the, ahead of a landfalling hurricane. It doesn't work for the community perspective. It has to be actionable, all right? Don't tell them about this is an anafront or a catafront, okay? <laughs> I, you know, I, I know it's important to us, but it's got to be related to their decision points, their thresholds for decisions. A 50% forecast, you know, at at um, at day one means diff is something different to an emergency management than if you're telling us, oh, just just keep that in mind. So we have to connect forecasts and decisions through impact basis and support services. And I mentioned this thing about the Weather Ready Nation ambassadors down here. Um, we, these are organizations. That, um, it's an initiative that was started. We are now, these are uh, groups, uh, usually uh, loosely coupled uh, organizations. You know, we work principally with government to government. Um, they're more formal in their processes. But we're finding that these ambassadors are extremely important in weaving all of our information that's not only coming from us, but from the media and 
into this into this web of, of community decisions and personal decisions. So this is an important part of the, uh, of the problem. So this is what we mean by impact-based decision support. So we do start. We want the best type of meteorological forecasting in the world. And I contend that our forecasters are right there with any, any forecast service in the world. And we use models from all over the world. They have access to every model, every um, ensemble system um, that's out there, including the European Center, including the UK Met, including Canada. Right? We got to get it to the forecasters' fingertips. You have to practice, practice, practice. You have to develop relationships. No part of the Wait, there are a number of reports coming out from different academy uh, reviews. Uh, Nonprofit reviews, the National Security Group, which is who I met with on Wednesday. The reason they believe we're doing this right with the emergency management is because we are getting out there months, years. They know. We know their, how they operate. They know how we operate. They know how to deal with our uncertainty. Embed. Embedding is becoming an important part, whether you know, this episodic uh, nature of the embedding is critical. That's what develops the trust with the decision makers. So this is what we're working towards. Um, this is how we can realize our intrinsic value. And this also will lead to our mission success. Now, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, because there were some people arguing, well, maybe we shouldn't be doing this outside the weather service. Leave it all to the private sector for that. Um, you know, people know how to make decisions, yeah, that kind of thing. We're now authorized by law. And we're told, uh, it authorized the National to address increasing IDSS needs at the federal, state, local, tribal nations. This is kind of interesting because there were people in OMB questioning us and doing this. What gives the federal government the right to tell a state organization what to do? Well, the fact is, we don't tell them what to do. We provide information into their decision process, right? And we're invited into their space. We don't invite ourselves. So we have to show that we have, and we have a value to them in terms of their decision making. We have to, we have to show them that. But this actually authorizes us now to do it. And then um, it also says do it within current resources. So that's basically telling us we have to be more efficient in producing a forecast and use those efficiencies to unlock resources within individual offices to then map in to the decision making that's, that's, that's actually occurring. And then the review by McKinsey showed that our local presence is absolutely essential to make this work. And the reviews of people, of other agencies' efforts to affect decisions and the failure of those is because they're not engaging at the local levels. They're being very explicit about it. And I'm you know, kind of waving that around now, even within this current administration. Um, that, that, uh, and previous administrations, I mean, my first m meeting at an OMB in 2013 was, when am I going to regionalize all the local offices? And my answer was, we might need more. That, didn't make me very popular. No <laughs> so, so the thing is, so the thing is, this is a key finding from the McKinsey uh, study. Now, what we're doing, I've always wanted to reference the Tocqueville. I read this as a freshman at Syracuse University. I actually went to Syracuse my freshman year. And I read this. Um, the Tocqueville was sent over here by the French government in the early 1800s because Europeans couldn't figure out how the hell we were even surviving as a country. <laughs> the national government was a mess. We had to go through a constitutional congress and change the whole thing about, you know, um, eight years after or ten years after the declaration. Um, how are they doing this? Because everything in Europe is top, was top down. There were kingdoms. You know, so, so they were struck by the extraordinary decentralized character of public administrations down to the local levels where most decisions affecting people's lives were made. It's almost an exact quote. Out of, the, out of this chapter. And then noted that Europeans accustomed to dominating central governments had to reconcile themselves with difficulty to the complex mechanisms of the administration of townships. Boy, this rang some bells. 
<laughs> Anybody's studied any history in New England, so I'll just remind you, that's Rhode Island. Smallest state in the country. That's 39 townships, right? Well, all the local decisions are made through those, uh, those folks. There's the governor, Gina R. Romano. So as we were setting up for this picture, I said, what do you do? In the decision process, and she, she literally looked over her shoulders and she said, coordinate, help, come to your needs. That's what we're dealing with in the smallest state in the union. In terms of, if you want to impact public safety, that's who you have to get to. Now, I went to Wisconsin. I assumed Wisconsin was more central. I don't know why. I was there for 11 years. Um, you know, the governor always, you know, they always, anytime there was trouble on campus, they certainly centralized the responses. So, so the thing is, the thing is, they, um, when I went to Wisconsin, and we met with the Central Emergency Operations Center, I said, and I mentioned that, well, how do you interact with the counties? He says, well, the counties are the easy part. He said, we gotta get to every individual town. Every individual town makes their decisions, whether it's for the schools, roads, public, and it could be a judge, it could be a police officer. It, it's the whole spectrum. You wanna get into the fabric of decision-making for saving lives? This is what you're dealing with. So we've committed ourselves to this complex mechanism of local decision makers. And this is what I've spent a lot of time, the Hill gets it, when we get the new administration in, the first year was interesting, but they're getting it now, all right? So it's, it's, it's something that we have to continually remind ourselves um, about how we're um, making this operate. So how are we doing? So, you know, measuring success in this arena I think there's probably about 100 PhDs in the making. And it, you know, we're having enough, we're having enough interesting times uh, just trying to understand how to deal with social science or how to bring social science in, you know, into everything we do. Um, when you get into the economic aspects of it, you know, and, and whether there's an economic benefit to this, I think there is. But showing it, it's just starting out. People are actually working on papers on this now, but there's a lot of work to be done. But there's, there are testimonials like this. All right, so this is Eric Waggy. He's uh, head of county. This is the county that has Minneapolis, St. Paul, and surrounding rural areas. So he sees the whole spectrum of, of local decisions. And this is what he said at a, at a conference. And he's pretty active in the International Association of Emergency Management, which is like our AMS, okay, the National Weather Association. We've revolutionized the emergency management community from one that reacts to events, that one that proactively prepares and stays ahead of extreme events. And I'll show you an example of how that works, like say, for hurricanes. But let's start with this case here. I'm going to give you testimonials. So I don't have charts, all right? I mean, I love, I, I, I love the research world, but I don't miss the, uh, the academic reviews when I come to <laughs> You know, I feel your pain uh, that the last talk. Uh, but, okay, so here's the pre-Christmas slum. This is, we're just starting to initiate this. Now, there were pockets of IDSS, whether we were calling that or not, in the Weather Service, but it wasn't a uniform. So we were, it's a dis, it was disjointed. So we were pulling this together in 2013, 2014. And we get into this, this storm in 2015. And what's really interesting about this is it happened over the Christmas holiday. So we were showing, or after the Christmas holiday, and, but decisions had to be made before Christmas. And one of the emergency managers were going to call their staff in. Christmas Eve and Christmas. Right? You talk about big decision. Right? So we had a forecast for this major storm system in the Midwest. And you see the... Uh, the surface maps here uh, from the 24th, 25th, and sure enough, you know, right after uh, right after Christmas, it starts spinning up and moving on out. Now, this was a, a system that um, uh, produced blizzards on the northwest side, flooding all the way up into the Ohio Valley, and severe weather outbreaks. So it was a threefer. Okay. So from a preparedness perspective. We had to increase the level of coordination across federal, state, and local jurisdictions before, during, and after the event. 
We maintain uh, situational awareness through NWS and liaison as early as December 22nd. So the big decision was on the 23rd, 24th, how, they were gonna, how the emergency management was going to staff and react. Um, I mentioned we had tornadoes. On the tornadoes, uh, there were federal, state, local, mobilized. FEMA was analyzing impacts, uh, support activation, deployment decisions. Um, you had uh, Southern Region Rock dealing with uh, uh, regional aspects, and then you had uh, local forecast offices uh, dealing, of course, with what they do with tornadoes. Now, what's interesting is that for the blizzard, it was basically at the state and local level, so FEMA didn't play in that. So you see a difference there already in terms of how, you, how that consistency plays across the spectrum of emergency management. Now, flooding was interesting because I mean, we emphasize FEMA in here, but there are also many other federal agencies involved. You get water involved. There are 24 federal agencies involved with water. 24. Okay. So there's a, there's a whole different emergency response there. States of emergency declared um, uh, in these uh, whole wide range from flooding to, um, uh, to the, especially the severe weather, and then the blizzard here uh, back in Texas and New Mexico was uh, pretty significant as well. Now, what was really interesting in the learning experience from this was the IDSS for the water continued for like two months. And this started opening our eyes to the notional aspect that IDSS for weather does not equal IDSS for water. And one of the problems that we're seeing in these long-term events, and we heard this directly from the emergency management community about two weeks ago, is message, they're calling it message fatigue. Right? He so, did this news conference out of the St. Louis forecast office and said that. Now, he actually invited us to the governor's um, a meeting. Um, I gave a 10-minute, 15-minute talk there. And um, he got up and said to all the governors sitting around, get to know your local forecast offices. Because you can't operate in the, if you want to be resilient and you want to be responsive, you got to be with them well before the event, during the event, and after the event. I mean, he was as explicit as you yeah, as you want. <clears throat> All right. Uh, yes, I have a bias. Northeast South Stone, so we'll get that out of everybody's <laughs> system. All right, so this was a, a, an incredibly well-predicted storm. All right, so again, another great success. Here's the storm system on, uh, on the 20... Um, uh, I can't remember the dates of these things. I don't, really, I'm getting old. Um, 23rd, 23rd of January, and then this is the seven day, five day, three day, two day, one day forecast for this. So it's pretty remarkable that a week before this storm, people were talking about the potential for an East Coast storm. And in this case, it really locked in. Yeah, there's some differences in the speed uh, going up the coast, but it generally locked in by day three, two, and one, with very heavy snows uh, predicted for the mid-Atlantic. And if you look at the uh, watch morning map and then uh, what actually happened, you see that we pretty well nailed from a watch warning perspective uh, where it was going to snow and where it was not going to snow. Right? So we didn't know before. But what's really interesting is look at New York. Remember the year before? We got Long Island there and then finally we upped it up just north of the city. But remember that sharp line uh, the year before mm -hmm. this? And everybody killed us because you know Manhattan only got eight inches of snow, and we're predicting 20. And then the emergency manager uh, got up and said, "Hey, by the way, Queens got like 20 inches of snow in the last, or 18 inches of snow in the last time I looked. That was more than New York City, right?" So, <laughs> so the thing is, the thing is, those lines, those boundaries are a killer. So great, yeah. Oh, this was an easy forecast, right? I guarantee you. Everybody was focused on, is that New York going to be in or out, right up to the last minute. Um, and you can see, if you look at the ensembles, part of the problem was, it's, gonna sh it's not going to run straight up the coast. Right? The ensembles gave us the confidence that there was going to be a sharp boundary because this storm was going to turn, turn to the right. And if you look at the uh, probability forecast, 48 hours snowfall two days prior. You see, New York, two days prior, we're still playing with them. 
<laughs> we were smarting over the last, the year before, right? And it wasn't until about, uh, about um, issued Friday night, this, this storm really cooked on a Saturday, that you see that New York City is in. And you think, well, they only had 12 hours notice. No, we were embedded with them. So we were uh, emphasizing to them this time, you know, right, you're not in yet, you're not in yet, but you've got a potential for this. So they were preparing for the worst. And then they were able to put, you know, literally pull the trigger for their operations with everybody ready to go once we did, once we did that. So if you look at this whole TikTok, Yes, we had the medium range. We were doing briefings, uh, partner briefings on the potential storm. We started doing media interviews on the 19th, on the 20th. Uh, the coordination briefings, blizzard watches were issued, uh, media interviews. Uh, I did a press briefing on a Thursday. This is Friday, um, Friday evening. You notice the storm is over my shoulder here. This um, had, there was not one flake of snow involved in the storm yet. And I'm doing a national press conference. A little nervous. <laughs> States of emergency. Now, the reason I felt I had to do this was the message fatigue. People were saying we were overhyping. You know, you, the media folks, you know, you deal with this all the time. You get death threats. Uh, Tom, Skilling, Tom Skilling was telling about some of the stuff he gets in Chicago. But after about the third day, he's kind of warning about the storm coming on. Um, I was up there saying, no, this is going to be a big problem. We have 50 million people going to be affected by this, and we've got coastal flooding we're worried about and everything else. We pull uh, the uh, snow begins in mid-Atlantic. Um, snow forecast adjusted to include New York City the evening before. They were ready. Now, how do you measure su success? This is a 2013 snowstorm. That's the Long Island Expressway. It took about three days to open that up. That's the, that's the Long Island Expressway during the storm. They were opened up in 18 hours. So there's an economic impact here. What's the magnitude of it? I don't know. Okay, but there are people studying that. There, there are pluses and minuses to this. Same storm, same boundary, no decision support from us, Pennsylvania Turnpike. And they had to rescue people here for uh, 30, uh, about 30 hours. They were rescuing people out of cars on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Okay? So, um, hurricanes. 1992, there was policy out there for the Hurricane Center. You are not to use a numerical, a global numerical model to make a forecast. All right. How many people were born in 1992? How many people here were alive in 1992? Okay. Uh, they remember. Uh, okay. Andrew was the one that changed. Uh, changed it. Brian Norcross, that's, that was the storm that made him famous. Um, this policy was changed after Andrew because we actually had an L, an L on the map that tracked Andrew. And the reason it was changed was because after Creamy, Florida, it was headed right towards New Orleans. And is it going to hit New Orleans or isn't it? You know, it turned out it shifted to the southwest of New Orleans. Um, we accelerated to use the models. We had the U.S. Weather Research Program and other aspects. Uh, we had this corner of uncertainty. That's Katrina. So the model runs, uh, we got the intensification track, broad cone of uncertainty. And we advertised these things, uh, these, the track and the intensity changes one to two days in advance. Not bad. If you look at what happened in 2017, Irma, 10-day model runs used to track Irma. 10 days in advance. Uh, development of the storm as a wave up right turn of the track was predicted about five days in advance. People argued about the east coast of Florida, the west coast of Florida. The Florida didn't care. The whole state of Florida was going to be impacted, right? State of emergency six and a half days before. So, but we still had issues nailing that down. So yeah, there's room for improvement. You look at IDSS. Andrew. NAC connected with national state emergency managers, but FEMA and national recovery assets not pre-positioned. It was not in their mission. Duck and cover for nuclear attack was the emission statement at that time. <laughs> Slow to react to natural disasters. National response, it took four days, four days after landfall. Okay, that's where we were. Now, Katrina, NAC again connected, and that connection has expanded. Variable connectivity with local, state, parish, emergency management communities. 
There were certain states that were not prepared uh, for Katrina. I'll just leave it at that. National pre-coordination of response was problematic in some states. Recovery supplies were overwhelmed. And you look at Harvey, Irma, and Maria, entire National Oil Service, entire national connected to national, state, local emergency water resource managers, strong connectivity, embedding at every level, all hands on deck. We were surging resources, personnel resources, to affected offices, ready, set, go mode with emergency management immunity seven days in advance, and consistent messaging or forecast. Now, when we look at the number of days in advance that we were involved with emergency management, whether it was briefing, embedding, all hands on deck, internal collaboration calls. These are the days in advance of landfall, all right, versus the four days after. And if you look at the, the deaths, you know, nobody wants anybody to die. What's really interesting about these two storms is that, as far as we know, there were no lives lost due to storm surge, which is really remarkable. And in Maria, this is an estimated death. I'm not challenging this estimate. But most of these deaths are associated with what happened post-storm. The fact that the entire infrastructure of the island was wiped out. And for a number of reasons, there was a slow response. One of the reasons being, there were other storms coming in. Okay? There were ships that were literally turned around. All right? um, so um, this is this, this deserves a lot of attention, a lot of study. I know there's still a lot of work going on to rebuild that infrastructure. So, but this is remarkable. This is remarkable. And I can tell you there are all kinds of testimonials as to how the co-location worked uh, with Harvey with the eye wall coming in and, and the fire chief standing right there with the weather forecasters looking at the GO-16 data saying, okay, you can go out there right now, rescue people that stood on the islands. You've got 45 minutes to get there and back. They've got 200 people left. Okay, so, and I heard that directly from the fire chief when I went down to Cor uh, Corpus Christi. So, uh, really remarkable. Florence. Um, this is the GFS, folks, not the European, okay? It's the GFS. <laughs> <laughs> it did all right. So, here's the situation. We have this track forecast, and you know, there was uncertainty from all of the models, whether go east of uh, Bermuda or west, and then finally locked in. But we started seeing this. And it's like, what? Okay. And then it started doing that. All right, come on, get going. All right. <laughs> and uh, do you believe it? How do you, how do you get somebody that you're, you're dealing with to make key decisions because that was making it like another Harvey in terms of rainfall in the Carolinas. Right. So, um, whoops. Okay, let's see. I might have to go back. That's what happens with these animations. There we go. So, the, so the Hurricane Center is working with the model on searches. And, you, and you'll notice that as um, this is you know, the start time, this is the five-day forecast with the cone. Pretty narrow cone for being over the middle of the Atlantic. Um, and you see this turn to the right. And then, well, the models quite aren't doing that anymore. And then they're all locking into this as that big anti-cyclone is forming. By the way, the forecast uncertainty is with flow in the extra tropics. Can't lose sight of that. And then you hit this part. Now, what's interesting here is, is that if you're working with your emergency management community, the folks who have to make decisions, they've gotten used to these kind of forecast evolutions over the period, but it takes time. That's why you've got to practice with them. But it was pretty amazing, and the NFC nailed it. All right. um, they did. There were like seven kilometer errors in track forecasts. That they, for a storm like this, it was really amazing. But that's not the whole story here. You've got, we now have surge uh, maps, and you look at this large-scale surge map, and as you start seeing details right in here, and what you'll start seeing now in our forecast is that we're actually um, can produce these maps and show the surge up the rivers. So trying to communicate to people living along here, they're going to get a surge from a hurricane that's hitting way down here without a map like this, okay? 
So these maps were created, testing over a two to three year period with social science helping us along the way on how to map it, the color codes, everything. And this is the way you get the emergency management community and the general population to focus. And then with the precip, of course, this is the uh, precip uh, forecast, and this was the uh, amounts, you know, in the th uh, three feet of rain, and it all looks great. Uh, if you're in southeast Virginia, you say, hey, wait a minute, you know, you, you gave us a false alarm here, right? Um, so this little dip, and what it did to the rainfall here as that building, building ridge came in, uh, was not accounted for properly, but here's where the key decisions were being made um, in real time now, and that certainly, that certainly panned out. And one of the things that we were able to show in terms of the flooding uh, aspects was the demarcation zone right in through here. So there were towns that we could actually, um, uh, Fayetteville, we actually advised with our forecast not to evacuate, and it turned out to be the right decision. And there were towns like in Dare, uh, or counties in Dare County uh, closer to the coast with 275 uh, residents that did evacuate, and this is what the uh, emergency manager had to say. Uh, can only be categorized as world-class decision-making support from unrivaled weather professionals that ensure timely and well-supported public safety decisions. Now, this is great. Warms my heart. But I got to tell you, folks, especially the ones in the service, these are the folks that are on the hill arguing for our budget. So when I say we touch every county every day, we're getting these county emergency managers doing this because they mean it. This is not a crowd that's easy to convince either, all right? So, now, remember the El Faro uh, with um, Joaquin, mm -hmm. right? Two, two or three different forecasts. Captain decides that he's had his forecast, he knows what's gonna happen. It was not the weather service forecast. After that, there's a, there's a process now in which we don't, we don't work with these individual ships, we work with the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard notifies them. This was the warning area there's not a ship in there. Uh, if you would have told me we could do this even two years ago, I would say you're crazy. Right? Not a ship in there. All right, severe weather. How, how much time do I have? Oh, I get plenty of time. All right. <laughs> um, I'm almost done. All right, so the severe weather. Um, this is I think this is this is not the 2011 kind of outbreak. Okay? I grant you that. It's not that. But it is an EF3. And it went right through a major metropolitan area on live TV. So I happened to see this happening outside my office. And I swear that as buildings were blowing up, as, as the building that actually can, you know, handles our pay, which shredded, and that was the first thought, of, oh, we got to get our check next. <laughs> um, this is this was amazing, and we had, you know. So my first reaction was, I wonder how many people we just lost today, right? Major metropolitan area houses and the like. Zero. Zero lives lost. So first thing I did is Ken Graham was the MIC of that office. I called Ken up. I said, How'd you do this? He didn't, he didn't talk any meteorology. People know Ken, he's a, he's a missionary. You know, he's like he leaves the church of IBSS. Okay. <laughs> and this is what he said. This is what he said. I was taking notes as you, you know. Talked about preparedness activities over a four year period. Uh, the deep relationships with emergency managers and uh, weather ready nation ambassadors that he knew he had phones like he knew he could contact these folks on phones if he had to on a first name basis with saying your 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 time up go right um, the, uh, the dissemination multiple dissemination paths the public awareness he, he in, you know he got right to the daytime event <coughs> visual it was all there working in our favor Okay. Collaborative forecast preparations within and, uh, NWS and larger enterprise was a success because it wasn't just the weather service giving out a consistent message. It was every private sector firm that had any kind of forecast responsibilities in that area. They were all on the same solid page. All right. 
They're part of our chat sessions. We're not telling them what to say or do, right? but they see the needs to do it. Many of them are Weather Ready Nation ambassadors. Over 100 meetings and tabletop exercise held in the city in the year preceding the event. IDSS provided days in advance of the tornado. That was his list. Okay. Now, you get the Taylor bill. Um, so that, that veering of the wind and all that, that's, that's your couple jets, folks. I, I'm just putting in a plug for my PhD work. Okay. <laughs> um, so there you go. Um, classic setup for Taylorville, Illinois. Um, this is December 1st, 2018. You look at the soundings. Um, you get, you're getting these classic profiles in here, and you see your, your spread out, moisture-laden, dry zone aloft. Um, everything's classic. Um, they had the uh, tornado emergency uh, put out uh, with uh, plenty of lead time uh, for a tor uh, tornado emergency. You look at the track of the storm itself, plowed right through Taylorville. Uh, there's your radar echo. Um, you know, it just maps. It's really a classic, right? Um, the kind of messaging we do now, we actually do put out messages like that. We were advised maybe 10 years ago not to, not to do this kind of messaging. Um, there it is. So, here we go again. There's the single tornado, zero fatalities. Now what's interesting about this is, this is again from the MIC of the, of the office. Um, we're talking about how we got the messaging out and um, that the event was well anticipated days in advance by SBC and the Illinois WFO. The first tornado warning was issued. There was this continuous, continuous interactions. Um, and then this is, um, um, this is only the second time that this office has issued a tornado emergency and people were ready for it. What really made this case unique was the fact that there was the Christmas parade that evening. And it was a decision that had to be made early. Are you going to have people going to this parade or not? Are you going to hold the parade? This was the key decision that had to be made hours in advance. And because of the interactions that they had to the IDSS, not the, you know, days before, all the way through, this is this, they, they canceled the parade, they kept the people off the streets, kept them in shell, you know, they, it, 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 it rose the whole situational awareness. So it says that, you know, when you read this, it talks about the, um, the staff readily available to discuss, available to discuss the likely impact and timeline was crucial. When I was director of OM and we were discussing the 1-800 number for the National Weather Service offices, and whether people were actually going to answer the phone or not because they're going to be too busy doing grids. <laughs> Honest story, 1995. Okay. <laughs> Available to discuss. This is what I mean about changing the paradigm here. So this was especially important as hundreds of parade participants were in place one block away from what ended up being the tornado path. So um, the entire decision support program you have long promoted worked flawlessly. It's clear from all the positive feedback we've received since the December 1st to the other emergency event, elected officials, media, community, at large, share that belief. It worked. Thank you. It worked. Now, Lee County. Um, this was a massive tornado. What was it? That final width was it 0.8 miles across? Was that the 0.9? Yeah. yeah. It was forecast. IDSS was provided days in advance. I sat across the, the group of emergency managers from uh, from Alabama um, the week after this, and they they started the meeting off. Eddie Hicks, before I could say anything, says, "I want you to know." We firmly believe you folks did the right thing. Right? I mean, that's the way the competition started. And we're, you know, we're, and I said, well, we're, we'll be right there when the assessments happen because you know, 23 people lost their lives. Now, there's all kinds of discussions about the shelters and etc. Um, okay, it's locals' decisions whether they're going to have shelters. You're in a, 
you got mobile home parks and the like. So there's work that has to be done. What struck me in reading the testimonials for and the newspaper articles you know, um, is that most people who were being interviewed in those papers said that they were confirming their threats by their interactions with their fellow church members. Okay. So we're, we're good at government to government, but now we've got the social fabric aspect of a community and how they're making the decisions. And when they sought shelter, they drove to their church. All right? Now, whether that was the safest place that they felt that they could be. Um, not shelters, not tornado shelters, not, okay? So there's, there's a different decision process going on here, folks. And this is not, so we can be authorized through government to government, but if we don't have those Weather Ready Nation ambassadors, if we don't have connectivity, if the forecast offices, and the forecast offices are probably the local offices, if anybody's gonna understand it within the weather services, they're gonna understand it, right? So, um, what 23 facilities? So this, uh, again, this is why I'm, one of the reasons I'm going to Birmingham today. I want to, I want to talk about them. So I uh, note the students. We want a highly trained workforce. Um, we actually believe as a weather service, we're second to none. So all this stuff you're reading about, you know, we're not up to the Europeans and all that other stuff, I don't buy it <laughs> at all. Okay, because I interact. I'm all over the world interacting now with the WMO members. And I know we're second to none, um, and it's our workforce that's bringing us to that to that level. We're going into an earth system science domain, so uh, we're very interested now in the coupling between atmosphere and land hydrology. Uh, doing flood forecast and getting that forecast out two days after the rain occurs is not good enough anymore. We got to have QPFs mapped into the flood forecast days in advance days in advance. Uh, ocean, you like a seven day forecast? Thank an oceanographer, okay? Um, you got that coupling has made a difference. In fact, it's making differences even in the, uh, in the short range forecast. And the cryosphere is a big deal. Everybody's seeing the uh, hypothesis, you know, what's going on up in the Arctic, is it affecting our, I'm noticing more blocking at higher latitudes. I don't know about you, but I'm noticing it in the northern, especially in our areas. So that's gonna be a big, a big one. Multi-model ensembles, social science, physical science, social science. If you want to do this, you got to have you got to have a team that can handle the whole domain of these sciences. Because I got to tell you, linking decision support and, and, and addressing not only the risk preference but the changing risk preference. What's your risk to a tornado outbreak if you're getting an outlook seven days in advance? What are you going to do? Well, I'll pay attention. That's your risk mm -hmm. preference. If you get a warning with 10 minutes to go, I guarantee you your risk preference has changed. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens in between? You just heard the expanse of my knowledge of social science. Okay? I don't know exactly what happens in between because people change differently approaching that warning. And they might even, there's even differences to the warning itself. We need to know that. With respect to multi-model ensembles, I'll just, I, we have multi-model ensembles now across the whole span from seasonal forecast down to the mesoscale. We're the only operational unit in the world that has this array of multi-model ensembles. Use them. Stop this discussion of the one deterministic run versus the other. It's not helpful. And in fact, in with Irma, it was getting in a way of decision makers actually keeping people's mind focused. So like that, it's gonna to go to the east of Florida, no, it's gonna to go to the west of Florida. It didn't make any difference for the storm surge up the east coast of Florida in Jacksonville. It made zero difference. In fact, it was worse because the storm went west of Florida, kept the southeasterly fetch there longer. They were gonna pull out of their, their readiness plans on that Saturday because, oh, it's going to the west, and we just heard, you know, you know, it was just, it gave me a headache. So, <laughs> the, the fact is, we've got this, we can use it. And why this is important is because there are more decisions being made here. You don't evacuate people 
the day before a hurricane. <laughs> you're, you're starting the process four days before, which means they got to have confidence in that forecast that starts at seven days before. Okay? We're in a world of ensemble modeling, and that's what you should be using to, um, uh, uh, to make your forecast and to deal with decision makers. And then you've got this communication and alert challenges. Um, Bruce, there is, there's no weather radio. It's on there, it's on yeah. there. All right. <laughs> um, but as forecasters, as people in the weather service, uh, as our IT specialists, as our folks who sustain these systems, and we review these systems every day, we check on them every system, the whole infrastructure of the weather service gets reviewed every day. This is what you're dealing with. This is what you're dealing with. Okay, international update. Just to let you know, uh, my role in the WMO could get interesting. I don't know if you heard, I'm actually running for president of the WMO, uh, which is on top of this job. And this is the raise I get, so. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, but the point is, over the last uh, three, four years, uh, we, you know, it's interesting in the, in the world, about half the weather services are there for weather modification, not for doing what we do. So think about that, right? And when they see what we're doing, they, their first question is, how do we even get decision makers interested in what we're doing? How do they get into the doors of these other government agencies? So we're working with the State Department. We've started these pilot programs. These were the first seven. They were ongoing. El Salvador has already uh, brought their weather offices into the uh, Country Emergency Operations Center. Um, and it proved, um, we're actually uh, getting some documentation on what it meant for the rainfall during Michael, which when it was off their coast. Um, so these offices are working. And we got two new sites, uh, Columbia, South America, and Sri Lanka will be starting up. And you know, we, there's a whole, there's a whole uh, TikTok of things that we do with them to get them ready, uh, to get these risk ma a matrix of impact and likelihood worked out. But the idea, fundamentally, is to get them together with their emergency management community in those countries so they can influence the decisions that are being made. Um, with improved forecasts, they have ready access to all our forecasts. And for South America, Caribbean, and Africa, uh, we have training desks. In the, in the weather prediction center, in the climate prediction center, that's trained um, about 300 people per region now over the last 20 years. So this is um, this is something that we're working on, and they're increasingly interested in not only how we make it work, but how we can make it work in their countries. The last thing I'll show is that I put this hourglass together because people want to know: Are we still interested in observations, numerical models, uh, having one network, uh, the national blend? All of these have been, you know, we know all of this. The integrated field structure, collaborative forecast process are extremely important to providing IDSS. I put social science here and not just up in the communication because to design our products and services to, to support IDSS, to ensure accuracy and consistency, it has to be fully ingrained in what we do. But the IDSS then becomes the kingpin in working with our core partners, uh, working through a multifaceted communication strategy with our ambassadors, that's how we save lives. And until we started doing this, I realized, at least I firmly believe, we were actually, we are now accomplishing a mission of not only providing observations, forecasts, and warnings, but linking them to the people who are actually out there saving lives and property. So this, is, this effort is not just a strategic exercise. This is us actually accomplishing our mission and realizing our intrinsic value. I firmly believe that with this, with all the challenges that we face in making this work, this is what we absolutely need to do, providing IDSS to realize our mission and realize the intrinsic value of what we do. So in summary, we're leading the U.S. weather, water, climate enterprise in building a weather rating nation, but we can't do it alone. We absolutely can't do it alone. We are moving beyond the forecast of, uh, and warnings. We're connecting these to decision makers. We're authorized to do it. We've had initial successful outcomes. The other, one of the successful outcomes of this, I, every forecast office I walk into now, they embrace this. They absolutely embrace this. They're, they're ahead of 
I mean, I sit there, I sit at conferences now, and I see what's going on, and I say, they got this. They really got this, all right? Um, can't let go of it. We've got this changing nature of the workforce, um, earth system science, and social science. And then spreading the gospel, we're, we're uh, working with the, the State Department and WMO members on these pilot projects. I believe this is really gonna take off uh, around the globe. Uh, people are seeing what we're doing within our government now and, and around the world. So with that, I thank you.